round of applause, and can we give it up to our worship team as well? Right. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm a part of the filming team. They just, it's not an official capacity. So I was doing my filming over there, and I don't know if you noticed this, but you guys begin to spontaneous come to your feet and applause the baptisms. Did y'all feel that? Did y'all see that? Did you sense that? Like, like that's a big deal because when a person is baptized, they're going public to the world that I belong to Jesus, that he is mine. He is my king. I'm in his kingdom. So, so already in this year, we've had well over a hundred and some people be baptized and publicly de- declare that they've come to faith. My prayer is that every year, not only is it 300, but it's 500, it's 700, it's 1,000. At one year, it would be 10,000 people in one year come to faith in Jesus. We want to reach not everybody, everybody. We want to reach everybody with the gospel of King Jesus. We are on a mission to do that. And I hope you are as well. Imagine if you had to cure the cancer. All of us have been touched by cancer. Imagine if you had to cure the cancer. I know what I would do. I would run through every hospital, be like, Oprah, give it away, give it away. You get a healing, you get a healing. Well, we have something greater than the cure to cancer. We have the antidote to sin, death, and evil. We have the holy serum, the blood of Jesus. We're walking through our series called Flourish. And the series was rooted in this Hebrew idea of a word called shalom. Shalom at its bare essence means this. It means harmony between God and people, between people and people and people and creation. When God says, and it was very good in the beginning. Well, this virus called sin has has messed up that harmony, and so the harmony of this beautiful worship in all of creation has been broken, but God, being the ultimate orchestra who wants to recruit people to play this symphony, comes in a person of Jesus to say, this is what the sound of God looks like. And I want to invite you to begin to play the instrument you were created to play. I want you to begin to harmonize with me. So that's, that's what flourish means. And so we've walked through various things. And I hope that the same way you uh, um, binge on Netflix, you binge on the sermons that we do. I hope you listen to them all week. Here's the advantage I have over you. You hear the sermon on Sunday. This message I'm doing today, I prepared last summer. So you know how many times I've preached it? So if you just hear it one time and then move on to the next one, I'm getting more out of it than you. So, so the same way you can binge Yellowstone, no, y'all don't watch that because y'all too godly. <laughs> but the same way you binge, you can binge the messages in your ride. When you're, let that seep up in you. So we talked about flourishing and uncertainty. A hundred years from now, if the Lord doesn't re- return, we're going to look at this part of history and go, that was an uncertain time. We had five-year-olds running for president or they acted like on both sides of the aisle. We had a pandemic. We had economic, I mean, it was just wild. It was crazy. We learned how to flourish in uncertainty, flourish in our finances, flourish in grief. And now we're going to talk about how do we flourish in our faith? Now, when I say our faith, I mean this, our faith in Jesus Christ. Not in a man-made religion, but our faith in Jesus Christ as his disciples, his apprentices, his students that are part of what's called the body of Christ. If you're new to following Jesus, literally, supernaturally, somehow, some way, the minute you say yes to Jesus to forgive your sins, you believe that he rose again, he comes to live inside of you, and the Bible describes you as his body, that mer- metaphorically, as well as spiritually, in reality, you and I are the multi-ethnic body of Christ. His mission, his ministry, and his purpose now belongs to us. One of the things you're going to learn here at Transformation Church, God's goal is not simply to get you heaven 
when you die. If that was the case, the minute you say yes to Jesus, he would have killed you and you would have been there with him. Why does he leave you here? He leaves you here so you and I can be a part of his restoration project. God isn't going to destroy the earth. He's going to make everything new, including me and you. But here's the deal, though. Uh, Teenagers, check this out. If you aim for nothing, you'll hit it every time. When you are unintentional, you are intentionally unintentional. Failing to prepare is preparing to fail. Some of you are incredible at your jobs and incredible at other things. You're detailed, you're meticulous, but in other things, not so much. So the older I get, the more I'm amazed and appreciative that I played in the NFL. How does a kid who got cut from Pee Wee League make it to the NFL? How does a kid that is a freshman in high school was 5'7", 132 pounds, make it to the NFL? How does a kid who started one year in high school make it to the NFL? Well, well, well God is gracious, but you got to cooperate with God's grace. Grace is a gift, but you got to unwrap that gift and apply that gift by faith. But it's amazing that I could wake up and eat the right way and train and, and, and do all these things to become one of the best in the world, but be a lousy husband, to be selfish, to be immature. Like, I could be mature on the field, but not at home. I, I wonder if many of us are kind of like that in our faith. We're very intentional about other things, but not intentional about our faith. And here's the thing. When we become intentional about our faith, our intentions of the other things we do will be enhanced, will be more powerful, will be more beautiful, will magnify Jesus. So, teenagers, how is it, young adults, people with wisdom hairs, if you're new around here, wisdom hair means people with gray hair. By the way, the goal is to get old. The goal is to get old. So don't be like, oh my gosh, I became 30. Like, what do you want to be stuck at 22 your whole life? Man, I was not a smart man, Jenna, at 22. (laughs) To flourish in your faith, for me to flourish in my faith, you need a vision. Vision is where you're going. Once again, if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. And you're going to spend time in the desert, just going around in circles. Then you got to have a strategy. A vision without a strategy is just a daydream. Have you ever been around people who talk about what they're going to do, and 10 years later, they're talking about what they're going to do? In San Antonio, Texas, on the west side, where I grew up at, that's called selling wolf tickets. You are selling wolf tickets, meaning... You are just going to talk about it. So many of us talk about it, but then we don't have a strategy to be about it. And we need a source of power to be able to accomplish it. Well, I've got some really, really good news. Here at Transformation Church, we have God's vision. Let me say it again. We have a vision directly from God. King Jesus himself, and we are going to be intentional here at Transformation Church to locate you and I in this vision and this story. Here it is. God's vision. Is that Jesus calling right there? (laughs) God's vision. (laughs) Become a great commandment and great commission person. Become a great commandment and great commission person. Where does that mean? Where does that come from? It comes from Jesus himself. So this is Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. It's in the New Testament, written by, you ready? Matthew. Jesus is in conversation with a religious leader, a Jewish religious leader who wants to catch Jesus in a trap. And he asks Jesus a very important question. What is the most important commandment? Because he's a Jew... He's not banking on Jesus saying these words. Shema Israel, Adonai Eleheinu, Adonai Echad. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one. So Jesus immediately begins the quote I'm going to show here in a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, primarily verses 
uh, four through six. He said to him, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Then he says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So the law and the prophets is the Old Testament from Genesis all the way to the Italian prophet Malachi. Malachi. Old preacher joke. So, so the entire Bible is summed up in love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So let me pause here. One of the questions I get the most is this, pastor, what is God's will for my life? And I say, you're not actually asking me what's God's will for your life. You're asking me what your career should be, and I have no idea. But I know what God's will is for your life, to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And by the way, if you like to teach kids English, be an English teacher. If you like economics, work at a bank. If you fly airplanes, be a pilot. If you like to serve people, be a professional wrestler. Not whatever, doesn't matter. <laughs> whatever you find yourself doing, whatever you're good at, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, or the way we say it here is upward, inward, outward. Can you imagine just for a moment what would it look like for the thousands of us that make up Transformation Church just for one day to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Can you imagine being so free in the love of God that no other person dictates your emotions? Can you imagine being so secure in God that what other people do don't offend you? Can you imagine being so in love with God that you become unoffendable? Everybody in our world, we are so waiting to be offended by any and everything. We are so soft. What you say to me can't bother me in light of what Jesus has done for me. Let me give you some OCB Gillum, i.e. my grandmother theology. Derwin, why are you worried about what they say? Their words can only hurt you if you give them power. Jesus' words will heal you. That's where we need to live from. To be, to be a people of love and what's sad, all right, parents, I'm going to challenge you. Dads on Father's Day, I'm going to challenge you. Here's, here's the thing is, is, is even for those of us who follow Jesus, and I know not everybody do, but even for the dads who follow Jesus, we're pretty much giving our kids a secular version of life. Go to college. Um, get some debt, go work really hard, move to the suburbs, and hope you can pay off your debt. Um, go to church once a month. Um, like, do we as dads grab our children by the face and go, today, I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit to be the love that has loved you in Christ. That listen, I want you to get an A plus on a test, but I want you to love your enemies. I want you to reach your friends for Christ. Next, great commandment. Then Jesus, as he's getting ready to ascend back to his father after his resurrection. And by the way, uh, when the Bible uses words like ascend, it doesn't mean that Jesus called up Elon Musk like, hey, I need to get back to uh, heaven. You got a rocket? So I want to take it because I know I got to go past Pluto into the Alpha Quadrant to knock on his door. Friends, heaven is all around us. There's, there's a spiritual war all around us. In some places, it's really, really thin, and we get a glimpse into to it. Heaven is not like, wee up in the outer space. It's a dimension all around us. Heaven just simply means God's presence. And so before Jesus ascends to the right hand of the Father to pray for us, he says this to his Jewish disciples. When they saw him, this is the 12 Jewish disciples, they worshiped him. Number one, this is how we know that the early followers of Jesus worshiped him as God because Jews are what's called monotheistic. They would only worship Yahweh. You should have no other gods before me. They're acknowledging that Jesus is Yahweh in the flesh. Appreciate that. Somebody got it. 
Jehovah Witness is going to come to your door and you're going to be like, I'm scared to talk to him. By the way, since we're here, why do, why do they know Scripture so much better than us? I mean, we're busy playing for miracles and healings and they learn and mess up theology. Guys, I work hard at teaching you theological sermons. You know why? So you can reach them at your door, not close the door and be like, they're here. Shut the door. <laughs> they're going to a crisis eternity and we're laughing saying, shut the door because we don't see basic things. This is basic Christianity 101. This is why we preach the way we do. This is why we teach the way we do. Every one of us here is a theologian. If you know your favorite sports teams, if you can argue LeBron, you can argue, argue Magic and, and, and Michael Jordan, you can learn scripture. You can apply the word of God. You can know the word of God. <laughs> oh boy, I begin. I'm like, can we stop talking? LeBron and Michael Jordan don't care about you. You ain't getting no money arguing about who the best. They better than you. There you go. <laughs> it's exhausting. I'm like, go read some doctrine, man. Learn your faith. There ain't no scripture, MJ 23, verse 3. Don't, what you laughing at? Because you know how you are with the Dallas Cowboys. I ain't going to mess with you today. <laughs> I, I'm still mad, though, because um, the Dallas Cowboys took a safety from Indiana in the third round when they could have drafted me in the third round. I play longer than him, by the way. But the seventh round safety they did drafted was way better than me. <laughs> and Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. This word nations means ethnic groups. So if you look around Transformation Church, it looks like every nation, tribe, and tongue. It is colorful up in this piece. You know why? Because of this scripture. We don't have a choice to only reach one group of people. God doesn't do that. People ask us when we planted Transformation Church, who are you going to reach? We said, people. They go, no, what kind? We said, sinners. They go, no, what kind of sinners? I said, black ones, white ones, Asian ones, Latino ones, rich ones, poor ones, men ones, women ones. And if Martians come, we're going to reach Martians too. Now, do not send me no email like, praise God, brother. I knew you was ready to go to the next level. We need to plant a campus on Mars. No, you guys would be shocked at the emails I get. The Martians need Jesus too. <laughs> Baptizing them just like we did in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Name, singular, plural. God is one, Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God, same eternal being, same co-equal. So this is what we do. This is the vision of who God has created us to be. So what is the strategy? How do we get there? Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is with us. So that's the vision. But the vision doesn't start with one day you and I saying, yeah, I'm going to love God. No, God woos us and opens our eyes and our hearts to his love. Okay, I'm going to teach you a big word here. On the count of three, say recapitulation. One, two, three, recapitulation. Recapitulation is a Greek word that comes actually from Ephesians 1.10. And in essence, it means to rewrite a story. So the word atonement, means the work of Christ. One aspect of the work of Jesus is not only does he forgive our sins, but he actually rewrites our story. Let me show you. All of us are born separated and broken. That's called original sin. If you don't believe me, why do children learn their first words, no and mine? Teenagers, why is it that when your parents buy you a Big Mac, fries and a Coke, and they ask for one French fry, you throw a fit? Ah, oh, 
No, think about it. They're asking for one French fry. Your mama carried you in her belly for nine months, fed you through an umbilical cord, and you say no. You live in a house you don't pay rent for. You have clothes you didn't buy. But don't ask for a French fry that you didn't buy. Oh, sigh. We need to be born again. See, our problem, teenagers, is not sin. The problem is we're dislocated from God, therefore we live a life absent of our purpose, which is called sin. So what does God do? In a gift of mercy and grace and kindness and love, he sends Jesus. Now watch this, for 33 years, you know what Jesus did? He said, Dad, I'm going to follow every one of the Ten Commandments because Derwin can't. Derwin is busted up, tore up from the flow up, but I'm not. Derwin is imperfect, but I'm perfect. Father, I'm going to do for Derwin what he never could do, not not because he deserved it, not because he earned it, but because I'm a good God and I love him and I want him to know me. So for 33 years, I'm going to live perfectly the Ten Commandments and say, Dad, I did that for him. And then I'm going to go to the cross. It should be him, but I'm going to do it for him. And all of the sin he's ever committed is going to be unleashed upon me. I am sinless. I'm going to die. I'm going to bleed to make him righteous. I'm going to bleed to make him forgiven. I'm going to bleed so that he can actually live. And that in that tomb, when I'm dead, that tomb becomes a womb of life. And when I get on up, he's going to get on up with me. And God, everything that I've done is accredited to his account. So you and I have a spiritual Venmo account. It's called first day, second day, and on the third day when he rose again, everything that Jesus did belongs to you. Listen, guys, that'll change your marriage, what I just said. You'll stop being so insecure when you don't get your needs met because Jesus is your security. When you don't get all the love you want, you remember Jesus is all the love you need. So it starts with him loving us. So let's get into the strategy. This is Alan Bacon. Uh, mm. So I met Alan in 1997 in the fall. We're playing the New England Patriots. I was killing them boys. Them suckers clipped me in the back. I was killing them, so they hurt my knee. I haven't heard God's voice many times, but this time I, I did. I fell to the ground. I heard the knee ligament snap. It was excruciating pain, and I heard, you're going to be okay. You're going to be all right. And I just had perfect peace. Now, that didn't mean I wasn't hurt the whole year. I was. Following week, I got invited to a Bible study, brand new Christian so Vicky and I went down to Blessed Hope Baptist Church in downtown Indianapolis, and this guy was teaching on Acts chapter 5. And I remember going, man, I want to know the Bible like that. I mean, it was riveting. I never knew the Bible could be so exciting and so amazing. That's the anointing of the Holy Spirit that was coming out of him. And so Vicky and I were like, hey, will you teach us? So we became friends. And he said, listen, Dewey, anytime you got a question, call me, anytime. Well, I'm a literalist. And as a professional football player, when the football season's over, you got a lot of time. So if I was up at 2 in the morning, I called him. And he would wake up and answer my questions. Now, he was an ordained minister, but his full-time job was with the city of Indianapolis. He was also a, a police chaplain for the Indianapolis Police Department. But, but, but this man discipled me. And he was proud of everything we did here. I mean, they kept up, he and his wife, they were proud of everything that we did here. A part of what we do here flows out of him. And so he recently uh, passed away. He had a massive um, heart attack, aortic dissection or something like that. Um, and then he had a, another one and uh, he passed away. As you can tell, like, you know, he was not overweight. He was in great shape. It was just his time. And one of the things that was interesting is everybody that described him at his funeral said he just loved so hard, and it's ironic that he died of a heart attack. Maybe he had no more love to give. His assignment was done. What I'm going to share with you 
five holy habits of being an apprentice of Jesus, a lot of it was formed under his spiritual care. And I want to share that with you. It was instrumental in shaping our church. And this is the strategy. So here it is. God's strategy, the five holy habits of an apprentice of Jesus. Um, Teenagers, and those of you new to to the faith, the word disciple in Hebrew is the word talamadim, and it means a student of a teacher. That's what rabbi means. In the Greek, it's almost like an athlete, but it's an apprentice. So we are learning how to draw life from Jesus so Jesus' life can be lived through us, okay? Our faith is not like the bumper sticker that says, Jesus is my co-pilot. Respectfully, that's offensive to Jesus. He don't need your help nor my help. You know how people say, brother, you got to live for Jesus. I'm like, he rose from the dead. Seems like he's living pretty good. Seems like we're the ones that need him to live through us. So it's a life of dependence. It's a life of reliance. Matter of fact, okay, teenagers, this is going to blow y'all away. You're going to be freaked out right here. There used to be a time in the summers when our mom and them would be like, go outside, don't come back till it's dark. Now, we didn't have Gatorade. We didn't have body armor. You know what we had? a green water hose at somebody's house. And we would turn it on and drink out of it, and it was good. (laughs) These five holy habits are the spiritual water hose of faith that we drink the living water. It's time for some of you by faith to open up the spigot and hydrate your dehydrated souls. First, the first holy habit is worship. All of life is worship. Everything you do is worship. If you're an economist, worship when you go to work, upward, inward, outward. If you're a teacher, upward, inward, whatever you do, professional athlete, whatever you do, whatever you do, all of life is worship. The only thing that we do that's not worship is Sin. Worship begins on Sunday. Current research shows about one, Christians attend about one service a month. And if you do the data here at Transformation Church, if everybody came at one time, we'd need like nine services. So I'm grateful for online stuff. That's cool. But that's a supplement. That's to reach. Hey, dads, I want to encourage you. Get your family here. Lead the way. Now, here comes a loving challenge. If you can sign your kid up for AAU basketball, football camps, and all this other stuff on Sundays, but all of a sudden it's hard to get up for church, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're failing to prepare. And if I can just lovingly say something to you, hear my heart, I know you want to be the next Earl Woods and Tiger Woods and Serena Daddy and LeBron and Bronny, but bro, if you're 5'7 and your wife 5'4, he is not playing an NBA. (laughs) It's genetics. When you fill out a recruiting profile from colleges, the first question to ask is, do you have relatives that played college or professional? Now, I don't want to, listen, I know you've been told you can be anything you want to be. No, you can be everything God's created you to be. Okay? And that's a good thing. My whole point is this. Our children know what our priorities are. Moms, dads, what are they going to know that your priority is? Worship is not just what you get out of it, but the prayers and presence you bring to it. All of life is worship. Where do we get this from? Here's the first holy habit to practice the presence of God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in the words of Chuck D from Public Enemy, brothers and sisters, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship, being a living dead thing. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. It all begins 
viewing God's mercy, thinking of God's grace, thinking of Jesus, flooding your minds with Christ. By the way, you already do that. The most important conversation you and I are going to have, other than with God, is with ourselves. What do you say to yourself? If I could record what I say and what you say, would you speak to someone like you are loved by Jesus? Connect. It's important for us to connect. What Alan and his wife Mary would do is they would come to the house and we'd study scripture and we'd meet with them and be in a part of small groups. And what do you do in a small group? First of all, is they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So this is the New Testament, the Old Testament about Christ. You've got to get in the scriptures. All right, let me calm down here. People will come to me, pastor, I need you to counsel me. By the way, I'm not the only person on staff with the Holy Spirit's power. Just because I'm the lead preacher doesn't mean I'm the lead counselor. We have a whole team of people who are gifted with the Holy Spirit's power. But one of the things I'll say after I assess what's happening is I'll talk about, so tell me about your spiritual eating habits. How much are you actually in the word of God with your wife, with your husband, with your kids? How, How much time do you spend in the word? Well, I'm like, well, what you want me to do? I mean, If Jesus said in Matthew 4 when Satan was tempting him, but as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that's out of God's mouth, then that's what we got to do too. I know you go, Pastor, I can't remember scripture. Oh, yeah, you can. Uh, What song should we sing to show that we remember scripture from the 90s? The only one that's coming to mind is this. Teenagers, now y'all better help me. Don't mess up my illustration, 90s kids. Jenny, Jenny, who can I turn to? Jenny, Jenny. How do I still remember that? How do I remember all the Public Enemy songs? How do I remember Mr. Telephone Man? Something's wrong with my line. Oh, oh. Okay, let me sing some white people songs. <laughs> Wake me up before you go, go. I'm just saying. <laughs> Second service, you never know what's gonna happen. Here's my point. When you meet in a small group, soak yourself in scripture. Fellowship, which is partnership in the gospel, spur each other on to grow. To breaking of bread, this is eating and also the Lord's Supper. And most importantly, pray. This is what a small group, this is what we base our TC groups off of. Get involved in a group, start a group, lead a group. Let me skip this next text, don't got time. Serve. Alan talked to us about serving, that, that to be on the team means that you have a place to serve, worship, and connect and serve. So people ask me often, Derwin, do you go to the Panther games? Nope. Why? It's better at home. I don't have to get in traffic. I don't have to do parking. My whole life going to games is I was on a bus with a police escort. You go to the stadium. You go get ready for the game. You go play and on your way back home. Man, you guys got to put up with a lot of stuff. But one of the things that I noticed at the games is people would wear our jerseys. And when they make noise, it's dope. But I ain't gonna lie, man. Sometimes you be in a game, and by the way, the other professionals get paid a lot of money. They're good too. And sometimes they just be wearing you out. Like there's some times where I'm like, man, I don't know if I want to go back in. And then you look at the fan like, come on. I'm like, come on then, homie. You can take my place. I give you my helmet. You try to tackle Barry Sanders and Emmitt Smith and cover Jerry Rice, if it's so easy. (laughs) So they're wearing jerseys, but they're not playing. I wonder how many of us wear jerseys, but we're not playing. (laughs) 
Yeah, I took you on a journey there. That's what I was waiting to get to. (laughs) But here's the thing, though. You were not created to be a spectator, my friend. You were created to play the game. You're created to serve in the kids' ministry. You're created to serve on a production team. You're created to serve in all the various ways that we can serve. It's going to take all of us to do what God has called us to do. The church is not a cruise ship. It is a battleship. And we don't shoot nuclear weapons. We shoot grace and mercy and truth and love. And you are needed. Jesus' word, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, that in the work of the cross is God saying, I'm a servant. One of the spiritual disciplines, holy habits, is giving. So early in my faith, um, Alan challenged me because I was like, okay, so talk to me about tithing. He goes, well, tithing is Old Testament. New Testament is generosity where you give above and beyond 10% because of God's grace. And I was like, okay, so do I give before taxes or after taxes? And he's like, well, how much do you want to be blessed? He goes, do you think the Lord was like, should I give all of my blood or 80% of my blood? I was like, oh. The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. I'm stunned. Like, I've read this for 20-something years, but it's hitting me differently now. Something that God loves. God loves a cheerful giver. So, you kind of know where I'm going already. It, if you get a raise, you're like, whoa, baby, I got a raise. What if we were like, whoa, we get to give. Man, let's look at ways to give more. And it's like we're excited about that. I think maybe that's more normal. What did Jesus say in Acts 20, verse 35? It is better to give than to <laughs> Lastly, invite. We live a life of inviting people to discover God's grace, that this is an intentional, holy habit. Now, uh, let me wake you up just a little bit. I hope that each of us, particularly those who follow Jesus, I pray that you got busted up, messed up friends who cuss at the wrong times, who have no clue that they are so lost, they don't even know they're lost. I hope that you're not in holy huddles because the one thing you will not be able to do in a new heavens and new earth is share your faith because everybody there will know Jesus. He has left us here to be on mission. And a thousand people move to the Charlotte area every week and many of them, most of them have no clue who Jesus is. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them. So Jesus, number one, you can't reach people you don't feel compassionate for. I promise you, nowhere in scripture are you gonna read or nowhere are you gonna read someone going, man, man, the Christians were so mean to me and those signs that they said that God hates me, Ooh, that's why I wanted to come to church and hear the gospel because they were so kind. I mean, last I checked, the Bible said in Matthew eleven nineteen 19 that Jesus was a friend to sinners. God will meet us in our mess, but he won't leave us messy. He'll transform us through it. Who's that one group of people that you got a thing against? I pray God brings you a whole bunch of them. You know why? You know why? Because they're going to teach you how to love. Because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of harvest to send out workers into his Harvest. 
let me show you a real-time example of why living an inviting life, of inviting people to discover Jesus is important. Take a look at this clip. So I grew up as an Hindu, family of um, my father, mother, and then um, two younger brothers. My father was uh, a truck driver, and um, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. Uh, my father worked very hard um, to provide for the family. He used to be out um, many nights, and uh, but he wanted to make sure that his uh, children, I mean, three of us, have a good education. So um, he ensured that he uh, provided for that. Got married uh, to Vino uh, in 2002, and then I also um, uh, uh, both Vino and I uh, grew up as Hindu. Uh, Rupa was um, uh, born. Uh, she was born. Uh, she's our only daughter, and she was born in India. And she came here when she when, uh, uh, when she was like two months old. Uh, and um, initial years of our marriage, some of the true characters came out. Uh, we started to have arguments and um, uh, sometimes the discussions would go to one of us asking for a divorce and things like that. It went uh, really bad. And um, we were raising our child in all the midst of all this. And at that time, uh, she was kind of the glue between us. I mean, we didn't want to separate because of her. In 2009, uh, we went to a friend's place um, in Denver. At that time, um, my friend's wife, she shared the gospel with uh, Vino. Uh, her teacher invited Vino to the church. She, she took uh, Rupa also with her, her daughter. So one thing that I noticed is the transformation in her. I just did, saw that 180 degree transformation in her, in her relationship I mean, after she became a Christian. That's what, I mean, prompted me to um, explore the faith. For me, it was a process. I would say in the course of uh, a year or two is when I accepted Christ. And uh, I started coming to TC um, around 2012. And previously, what I used to say is that, I mean, the, the glue that held me and Vino was Rupa. And then uh, afterwards, the glue was God. But for coming from the culture that I am and I was sort of from, usually love is not shared very vocally. Um, I, I'm just thinking, I mean, from her side, I mean, she's growing, like I said, she came here like when she was two months old and uh, she was pretty much was raised here. She would have seen, um, uh, I would say, her uh, classmates and their parents interacting and how um, uh, their parents say, I love you, right? I mean, in different settings to their children. But I, I don't know if she missed that. She never told me that. But I think I should have. Um, uh, though, uh, though I, I mean, I know I love her but I should have uh, expressed that, affirmed that in words. I mean, she's, uh, she's just happy that um, I'm making intentional changes, right, to, to express my love to her. So that itself is, uh, it's a big thing for her. And, and she, I know she appreciates that. So Rupa, um, I know uh, you have been um, a blessing to us both, um, right from um, a young age when uh, Appa and Amma's relationship was not that great. You have taught me a lot. Uh, you have taught me a lot um, as a Christian, as a, as a person. Um, you have taught me a lot and uh, I thank you for that. That's the power of the gospel. A woman shared Christ with Vino.
from that, they became, start coming to Transformation Church, and you look what takes place. Sometimes we think we have to be more than what we are. Share your story of grace. Who were you before Christ? How did you meet Christ? Invite others to receive Christ. Invite others to sit under the preaching of the gospel. All it takes is one invitation to go from the verge of divorce, a Christless eternity, to your testimony bearing witness to the grace of God. Now, lastly, though, we got to have God's power. We got God's vision. We got God's strategy. In Transformation Church, we have God's power. And I want you to understand, is in the, is in the next few years to come, we're going to have more campuses here. We're going to dot this city. We're going to dot this surrounding area. We're going to influence and touch the world. Why? Because people matter to Jesus. Therefore, they matter to us. How much do people matter to Jesus? Look at the bloody cross and look at the empty tomb. But we got to have power to do it. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power. This is an interesting word. In the Greek language, it's the word dunamis. And in the 70s, J.J. Evans, dynamite, used to say it all the time. That's where we get the word dynamite from. It means Dunamis, dynamite. So you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Now, please understand this. Jesus walked in the power of the Holy Spirit, and he was not weird. I'm not sure why we think the Holy Spirit has to be weird. Jesus was powerful and beautiful and forgiving and loving and knew his purpose. The power of the Holy Spirit makes us more human and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So let's pause here what if the early Christians would have stayed just with the Jews in Jerusalem we wouldn't be here. What if they would have just stayed in Judea with the other Jews we wouldn't be here. What if they just stayed in Samaria with the Samaritans, we wouldn't be here. But they went to the ends of the earth. We are the legacy of this verse. What's our legacy going to be? I'll tell you what would be super dope. I was doing an interview the other day, and it was like, what do you want to be remembered by? I said, why anybody got to remember me? I want people to remember Jesus. And but wouldn't it be cool 40 years from now, 50 years from now, that there are transformation church campuses where God's vision, God's strategy, and God's power is alive in people. That the world is fundamentally different because we said yes. Would you say yes today? Don't just wear the jersey. Get in the game. Let's pray. Spirit of God, you're good and you're gracious. Take these feeble words and make them strong in us. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I want to pray first and foremost for those who don't know Christ. Today is your day to come to Jesus. No more, no more waiting. The wait is over. Take his hand now. Say this to him, Lord Jesus, today I confess my sins before you, and I believe that on that bloody rugged cross, you took my place to give me grace. You were disgraced but that precious blood forgives me, makes me righteous. You rose again on the third day to live in me and make me a part of your family. I believe and I receive. I choose to follow you. And this next invitation is for those of you who are in the stands and it's time for you to get in the game. We've got God's vision, God's strategy, God's power. It's time for you to be all in. Today's a new day. In the silence of your heart, I want you to just say, I'm ready to be all in. I'm ready to be an apprentice of Jesus. I want to live God's vision, grow in God's strategy, and receive God's power. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Can we give God a round of applause? Yeah. All right, check this out. If you're watching online by TV, a QR code 
is going to pop up. It's going to sound just like that. Just kidding. Grab your smartphone, camera app, point it at it. going to take you to our connection page. And I want you to pray. I want you to write on there, I pray to receive Christ or, man, I'm all in. If you don't have a physical connection card, we want you here in service to point at the QR code in the back of your seat. That'll take you to the connection page as well. If you have a physical connection card, we want you to fill that out as well. Let us know you pray to receive Christ. And our soul tattoo is this. You can flourish in your faith. God's strategy, God's vision, God's power. Here's the action step. Take your next step by visiting our website for different ways you can worship, connect, serve, give, and invite. In the words of the great philosopher, Forrest Gump, that's all I got to say about that. Can y'all welcome Pastor Paul up?